Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you to the last session of this wonderful conference. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Arvind Birmani as the keynote speaker for today's session. Dr. Arvind Birmani is a full-time member of Niti Ayo since November 2022. He earlier served as chairman of the Foundation for Economic Growth and Welfare and president of the Forum for Strategic Initiatives. He also served as executive director, IMF, chief economic advisor, Ministry of Finance, and principal advisor, Planning Commission. He was director and chief executive of ICREA. He has published extensively and has 37 journal articles, 24 books and book chapters, around 70 working papers and 50 policy papers in macroeconomics, growth, tax, and tariff reform, foreign exchange, international relations, and national security strategy. Dr. Virmani has been a key figure in macroeconomics and policy reform. He was a mentor in public policy and economics in FICI. Technical Advisory Committee on Monetary Policy, RBI, Executive Director, International Monetary Fund, Member, Evaluation Committee, Independent Evaluation Office, Chief Economic Advisor, Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance, Principal Advisor, Planning Commission, and Member, Telecom Regulatory Authority. He has made significant contributions to economic and financial reforms in various areas, including customs tariff, income tax, corporate tax, indirect tax, trade liberalization, foreign exchange, banking and capital market liberalization, and sectoral reforms. He has also provided expert advice on macro management in various crises, including India's balance of payments crisis, Latin American crisis, Asian crisis, and the global financial crisis. Dr. Virmani, we are delighted to have you here with us today. And I invite you to speak on India at 100, which is a very relevant topic today as we move towards celebrating the PAL. Yeah. And also, uh, as you all know, that India aims to become a developed economy by 2047. So there is a lot of excitement about how to get there. And I'm sure he's going to give us all the solutions. So, uh, Dr. Virmani, also, we have about an hour and 15 minutes, and I'll leave this to Dr. Virmani, how much he wants to divide it between presentation and interaction. So whenever you are free from the presentation, we can have an open interaction. Hopefully 45 minutes and 30. Hope you have 30 minutes of questions. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll go on and on. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Virmani. Uh, so I, I have been here uh, many times, of course. Uh, as CA, I was also on the board for a little while, I think for two, three years. Uh, always a pleasure. Uh, so uh, this is actually kind of the first uh, talk I'm giving uh, uh, to an academic audience. Uh, so uh, I would say, uh, Feel free to uh, seek clarification, but comments and discussion we'll have at the end. Comments, questions, and discussion. Okay, let's see. Huh? Let's see how. Let's see. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, 
so there is no watch you know i often wonder why nobody no hall has a watch in front <laughs> that would be my one suggestion have a watch uh, put up on the other side uh, clock i i meant <laughs> anyway yeah so uh, uh, there there are two you know i've been doing uh, medium long term uh, forecasting and macro is not the subject today for for like decades so basically there are two uh, kind of technical things i use what, uh, so sorry i start with the introduction so what is the goal uh, the goal is sustained fast inclusive growth where we are measuring uh, growth in terms of per capita gdp that that's really uh, the objective uh, of medium long term growth in my view and and basically i use uh, two concepts a uh, uh, concept of catch up growth model based on global experience with you know starting with the so called miracle economies etc latin america all that stuff which now half of it as if i don't remember anymore but uh, it but is there somewhere in my head and uh, where the key role uh, is for policy reforms and of course a secondary role for institutional reform so uh, that's what i've uh, done for now decades and if you go to my website you'll see tons of those papers which were mentioned there which all relate to growth and reforms not all most of them the the second uh, uh, thing i'm using in, in these particular uh, forecasts which i'm going to tell you and then we get into the policy etc cetera, etc cetera, if we have time uh, is the uh, demographic evolution of india and the world uh, very briefly i'm not going to go deeply into it because there's too many other things to talk about so so basically uh, given uh, that the working age population of the developed countries is going to decline and india's is rising uh that uh, uh based on that uh i believe that the dynamic comparative advantage for india is going to uh, shift from unskilled labor intensive to semi skilled labor intensive to skilled uh, labor intensive form of uh, economic production now a little bit more uh, i'll say on that how that links up uh, in the next uh, two slides Uh, but then i also uh, uh, go into the means for achieving these objectives which i have outlined uh, on top so so uh, let me start uh, with the outcome and then we'll go back to what what has to be done and what needs to be done i guess this is the pre version so i have shifted that bottom stuff to the end but anyway it doesn't matter uh, so uh, uh, according to these projections uh, india will be a high income country Uh, by the middle of the uh, this current century uh, moving from where we are lower middle income to upper middle income around 2035 or actually earlier and high income after 2050 and uh, uh, this is something which uh, pe some people think of as a paradox I, i don't think it's a paradox but i want to mention it up front now public welfare of course we measure average welfare in terms of per capita gdp at ppp and india will go from its current 150th position in the world to around 90 this uh, projection these two projections are all kind of broad and indicative of a trend not to be taken uh, literally because you cannot take anything to do with beyond 10 years very literally i mean that's the basic thing always to keep in mind and uh, uh, the poverty uh, uh, because people ask for it i i put it there that poverty in in a paper i've done which we showed that the absolute poverty is already less than 2% so it's over so we need to do it in now in terms of what may be called middle income uh, poverty which is dollar 3.2 uh, per day per person and uh, which is currently around 20% will be also be eliminated you know in, in this process as we move from upper middle uh, income to high income okay then economic size and power which i am not going to talk too much about uh, today which uh, the slide i shifted to the appendix if anybody is interested we'll talk about it but india will uh, go from being the fifth largest economy to three actually that will happen quite quickly and you will see the key issue is of closing the gap with china which i'll show some okay now uh, th this is always nice because uh, in non academics want uh, you know some 
something they can feel and see. So I put this slide in uh, for them uh, after I did the paper and it's kind of useful. So uh, th th there are uh, threats and opportunities. What are the big opportunities uh, on which this, uh, and I'll give you the exact growth rate in the next uh, thing, but uh, what are the opportunities? One, I've already mentioned the global and Indian demography and the share of working population. I think that's the big opportunity for India. And second is supply chain diversification. It's happening not just for economic reasons that we noticed five to 10 years ago uh, that uh, India's uh, average wage uh, or, or the manufacturing wage is now lower than China. That's been for some time. But the big new thing, of course, is this whole uh, diversification, which has come uh, from geopolitical reasons. And of course, the pandemic. But pandemic is just a kind of wake up call. The real drivers there are the geopolitics. And threats which can be uh, converted into opportunity, oil and energy prices uh, is always a threat. Uh, I, I mentioned this whole bunch of papers on my website. Uh, the first one I did, which shows the 1971 oil shock, what a, a strongly negative that effect that had on the Indian economy. And uh, since then, uh, as was mentioned, I've dealt with many crises and it's generally the oil price which really gets us. So oil price is very important. So what uh, the change uh, in approach to India becoming a leader in so solar power. So that's a threat which we are converting into an opportunity. And the other one I just mentioned, the aggression. Uh, I, I hope you're all familiar with what has happened on the northern uh, border in the dark uh, since 2020. So this threat is real. Uh, uh, people don't realize it because we tend to underplay it. Foreigners don't realize it at, uh, at all. I have a very old uh, Brazilian friend who was here two, three days ago who who's really uh, interested in India and has followed it, but he was clueless about it because we underplay it. He had no idea. And, and the simple fact that we now have 50 to 60,000 troops, Chinese troops sitting uh, on our border, okay? That is completely new. It's a new threat. It's nothing like it's been uh, in earlier years. So, so what is it? How to convert it into opportunity? It's set up a defense industrial complex and we are doing that, right? So there is a threat. We can't directly do anything about it. So let's use that as an opportunity. And then there are weaknesses which are critical, which I'll talk much more about uh, subsequently, is the level of education and job skills is clearly uh, totally inadequate. Uh, uh, so we have to create and, uh, and I divide it into three parts, which I'll talk more about the low, medium, high is very important. And of course, the low female parts, labor force participation uh, rate, which everybody now is aware of and talking about. Uh, but this uh, work from home concept, I think, is very important. And here, I welcome uh, feedback and comments from people. Uh, and, the, uh, and the thing which has been there with us for a long time is the structural employment uh, trap. You know, we are in with 67% of the population in rural areas and still about 50% dependent on uh, Indian agriculture. So uh, I've just put down some things I can, we can discuss. There's all, all kinds of very difficult problems, spatial planning, district down. There's a whole bunch of plan type of issues there at different levels. I won't be getting into it, but I, I just put it down there. So, so what are the key pillars of this? Uh, so we need sustained fast economic growth. Uh, uh, I have assumed in this uh, 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 a pattern which averages out to 5.8 years, 8% per year uh, over this 30 year period is basically uh, because of the um, pandemic shock, the growth is low for this decade, it will rise a bit and then decline a bit. That's where the growth dynamics uh, I mentioned comes in, you know, the catch up, etc. And, and if you just translate that average population growth of 0.6%, so GDP growth average 6.4, just simple uh, arithmetic there. This one is very important and I'm going to come back to this uh, equality of opportunity, uh, women SCST and the digital revolution. And I believe that we can uh, start a virtuous cycle with econ equality of opportunity in this sense, driving growth, fast growth, driving you uh, being used for equality of opportunity and the digital transformation. This is one of the important elements of it, which I'll talk more about, uh, will drive both of these. Some three pages, three, uh, uh, pages of or, or slides of numbers here, just to give you an idea of what is happening. Uh, so is this working?
another one is uh, even more uh, relative to the US, it's more or less more random. Uh, just to give you a background, the developed country stuff I take from OEC, and the world one is just there to give you an indicator. Right? I, I won't take that. is to 130 percent by 2050 the purple line which is the left side and relative to the us one tenth of us to one third so this is an important number which i tell foreigners that will still be relatively poor uh, compared to the us even in 2050 and remember that paradox we'll be 50th in per capita term still and even though we'll be the third largest economy okay so uh, uh, here is some uh, some numbers, uh, just to read them off, uh, again, India's per capita, I already mentioned this, uh, living standards, roughly, uh, you know, the, the measures which I've given are standard World Bank classification, but just to get an idea, we'll still be uh, living standard, again, I use this for the public generally, would be uh, EU of the mid-90s, so we, we are nowhere near, a, you know, in terms of per capita, we have a long way to go, uh, but, but still, uh, and this is the important one, which uh, you see the graph next uh, figure, that GDP, in terms of GDP, PPP, India, China will go from what, 41% uh, of China to about 80%. And this is very important. And I have a uh, index which I developed uh, in the early 2000, which I call VIPP, uh, which uh, measures uh, the economic power and pot potential total power of a country. And basically, uh, that will go uh, from about 15% uh, of China's to around 83%. So that is going to be an important development. And you can see this in a graph, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, as you all know, we've been declining relative to China. This is uh, all relative to China, uh, three categories, per capita GDP, uh, and India's economic power, which I mentioned, the VIPP index. Uh, and this green line is in current dollar terms, just to give you an idea of how this is in PPP. All the rest of the stuff depends on PPP. The VIPP index uses uh, both uh, GDP size and per capita income. I don't have time to get into it, but if somebody is interested, I can discuss it. But the important point here is that index roughly equals, uh, at this point, the, the simple stuff which people do in terms of relative dollar in income of the country, uh, GDP. So, uh, but, but projection of this is, is very difficult and wrong, mostly. What I have seen, this is not the right way to do it. The only way you can do it is, it is in terms of PPP. Just because uh, exchange rates, etc. very, very hard to predict uh, exchange rates. Uh, so, so, in some sense, this, uh, this green line should roughly match this as we go up the Okay, uh, so uh, now we come to the substance. So that's the background, the, the growth projections and where we hope to go. And as I said, it's conservative. So, so uh, uh, this, this is very important. Uh, again, uh, I, I don't know, it, it's kind of simplistic for academics, but I'd like to get your feedback. Everybody knows this in this whole Delhi University would be useful to know. So uh, what we are uh, on since, uh, Narsimha Rao, uh, Manmohan Singh's time is to gradually define the role of the government and the private sector, uh, and I've been involved in that as part of it. So role of government, private and social sector, government to focus on public good provision, uh, market environment, and welfare transfers, which is obviously a role for the government, and private sector must be uh, compete, innovate, and invest. Uh, social sector, I won't have much time because of the shortage of time, but if there are questions, I can talk about it. But one of the things which we, we know from earlier research is that the provision of public goods is very uneven. Actually, it's it, what should be equal for everybody is, is much less in the poorer areas and for poorer people. So part of that uh, thing will actually become more equal when you have proper public good provision equal for everybody. So just by having equal access and equal quality, you move 
some of that is a problem. But, but there are some other elements which will come in. Yeah. Now, th this is the key here, uh, which I mentioned, uh, is the gap which we have to close. And finally, uh, you hear a lot of on AI, and it worries me because everybody has a uh, their own view of artificial intelligence. I, I prefer to think of it as expert system. So, so what are expert systems? They are actually a substitute for skilled labor, and one can leverage these expert systems, for example, to use semi-skilled labor where as a substitute for skilled labor. So, what is that? Uh, help. Okay. So uh, let's see how, how much time. Okay. So so uh, maybe I'll come back to that. It, it's um, yeah. I, I'll leave it at that. Uh, for those of you who are interested, please you can note down. Uh, on a paper. I'll come back to that. It will come up again. So uh, 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 let's go to supply chain. I already mentioned the geopolitics of it. Uh, and basically, uh, these things are very important because that is uh, how I see it. There is going to be high tech decoupling between the US West uh, with the PRC. And the reason is that, again, you may find it an outrageous statement, but I've been following this for 15 years or 20 years, that they, they have now. They politely copied from the West. They have taken and copied it, everything, including the W2 nuclear bomb, which was 10 years ago, uh, their, their most sophisticated bomb. Uh, the US found that there was a Chinese test, and it exactly matched this W2 bomb. So th there was no inescapable conclusion that they had stolen it. Okay. So, uh, so there will be decoupling uh, uh, and this whole issue of friend shoring, whatever, they all kinds of funny words to it, is going to happen. Uh, second is the economics are, is obviously uh, much less uh, because of uh, the globalization it will not be reversed, but you will get two economic blocks uh, with greater trade within each block than across blocks. Uh, to give you an idea of why this is going to happen, uh, I, some numbers which you may not be familiar, it was quite shocking to me when I saw this because the PRC has a manufacturing monopoly. I don't know what else to call it with these kind of numbers. Uh, it has currently 47% uh, of the market for textile. The entire world export, 47% of it. Uh, EDP and office equipment, 40%, telecom, 39%, and clothing, 30%. I have never seen numbers like this. Absolutely incredible. And it's incredible that nobody worried about it. There's going to be supply chain diversity. It's inevitable in my view. And that's part of my, is behind here in my growth projection. Okay. So, so what about India? Uh, so India, I, I favor, this is a personal thing, which uh, not take it as a government view, in my view is that we need uh, what I call a dualistic trade policy, uh, where you treat uh, the People's Republic of China with symmetry, you give them the same policies they have used against us, uh, but the rest of the world more like a classic free trade. Okay. And uh, uh, one important thing, I don't think I come back to this, but FTAs with de developed countries is very important for this purpose, because we are completely outside the supply chains uh, so far. We have to get into that. that. That's a critical element of my testimony. Thing. So, uh, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, many of you, because you're academics, you don't follow all the reform, but there's uh, there were big gaps in the reform which we did. I was part of them under Manmohan, Chidambaram, all those reforms. Uh, but the, the missing parts have been filled in since uh, around 2019, September. And very quickly, just to go through them, uh, for the first time, uh, concentrated attention to factor markets, public sector reforms, and for all uh, other products and services which were not covered. We covered a lot of them in the 90s, but they were not all covered. 
so going systematically and saying, okay, where are they not covered? Uh, uh, for example, atomic energy, space, uh, drones, uh, mapping, whatever. You know, so wherever there are products and services which have not seen reform, systematically going through them since 20, uh, 10, uh, 2019 and uh, trying to reform those. Uh, institutional reform, IBC, one of the biggest reforms, uh, you know, in 2019, there was a corporate tax reform. Uh, some of uh, us, including my old boss, uh, all know the name of, uh, don't mention his name because he may not want to be quoted, uh, you know, wanted the bankruptcy provisions to be in that corporate law. And they actually, this gentleman got it in there and they were removed at the last moment. They never went through. So this is a huge reform which has happened since 29, you know, since 2014. Uh, Monetary Policy Committee, I'm sure you all know uh, about uh, GST, uh, the biggest constitutional uh, amendment in the economic sphere since the formation of the Republic. Uh, resource auctions, now they're comprehensive. I remember struggling for 15 years to get resource auctions. In, in one uh, time, uh, I forget whether he was the law minister, the Congress law minister. We were at a, a seminar in Stanford. And I said, you've got to have telecom auctions because auction theory, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. You, you know, with our unique things, the only way you know the value is through an auction. There is no other way to find the value uh, of a uh, unique mineral resource or, or a spectrum in one geography versus there's no standard. There's no market. There's no you know, hundreds of suppliers and demanders, just the spectrum. Okay, you don't know the value, it differs across geographies. So, uh, and, and he said, he said, shook his head, it never happened. Even uh, my old boss, Dr. Manmohan Singh couldn't do it. So much resistance, so you know why. Because if you have an auction, a good auction, properly designed, you know what the price is, the guy who gets the thing, gives you that price, there's not much scope for under the table stuff. If you have arbitrary price, you can set it at anything. He has a lot of spare money <laughs> beyond what he's going to earn from that in his own mind. That, that's the whole point of an auction is we don't know. Those people who are going to mine or use the spectrum are better informed. They have to be, because they're going to make. Anyway, so uh, social reform, uh, uh, public health, uh, the Swatch Bharat campaign, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of my friends uh, used to say, why do you support Modi? I said, here, go ahead. I have a booklet I wrote in 1999. It has 20, 30 pages of reform. I say, here, look at it. It's in my book. If he does it, why should I not support? I'm supporting the, the reforms, not the person. Public good. You know, I, I still remember when the Swatch Bharat campaign was announced from the ramparts of uh, red fort and everybody said here the prime minister on uh, august 15 talking about toilets i didn't think that i thought it was really great that somebody is thinking of public anyway so uh, dbt etc okay so th there's a problem here there are the key problem here is rural urban differences in quality of education information and i want to say more about that let me try to speed it up. So bureaucratic reforms, you all heard of ease of doing business, etc. Abolishing, this is very slow, very painful, very hard, huge resistance. Uh, and, uh, and the use of technology to skirt barriers and leapfrog uh, legacy. Okay, so, uh, so I want to uh, say a little bit more on uh, the knowledge economy and on the digital economy. And the rest of it, I'll kind of rush through. So, so what is it? And this relates to academics and where I need help and where you, you should think about these issues. So access to information, to get the right information to right people at the right time in the right place, it's far, far more difficult than you can imagine. Okay? At all levels of education skill, low, medium, high. Uh, as economists, you know there are huge externalities, high social returns to information. Uh, we, we know from agricultural research, etc., they, they had the highest gap between the social and private returns. These are old, like 50 year old studies. I've not seen any uh, recently, so that's an imitation, or if you know about that, I'd like to hear about that. 
So for low income, less educated, low skill, basic education, education and digital literacy. I have stories, but I'm going to skip them now. Uh, this story actually came from the only person I called on after I became member was the president of India. And she told me this story, but I, I'll keep it if somebody is interested. So basic education and digital literacy, operational knowledge, you know, just how to do the work, huge productivity gap, because they don't have the information. Job skills, work knowledge, connectivity to supply chains, all this information is missing. You know, we just imagine we sit here on the internet, we go to Google, everything is there. But we cannot, we don't understand how little information is available to the persons at the bottom. Access to information, medium skills. This is another area which people don't understand. People who talk about knowledge economy and digital. So educational, health, personal service, construction. The standards and certification. When we first about 15 years ago, we set up a skill development corporation. I was there also in the finance ministry. Uh, we thought we need to bring in the private sector who will give the demand to set up this. But not enough being done. And the opportunities now are huge because of globalization, work from anywhere, work from home. We need to have international standards. I'll give you just one simple example to give you an idea of what I'm saying. Uh, just two examples. One, a friend of mine, his, his uh, daughter had a bad accident. He couldn't find a speech thera therapist or a physical therapist in India. He went abroad, he got a job just so that he could find a good speech therapist. Huge opportunity here. We, there's so many skills we don't have. Another example, which I just learned two months ago, one of the largest construction companies in India, I won't name it because it was inside information, has 1.5 lakh vacancies for construction workers. One company. You would say construction or what? Well, a plumber is not a plumber in a construction company. It's the same, he's called a fitter. He's doing plumbing. He's doing the pipes for the chemical plant. It's not, it's not the same thing. You have to have the skills. You have to have the standards. You have to have certification. You can't just take a plumber who comes to my house all the time. He messes up and put him on, on the chemical plant or anything, right? So skills, middle skills. I call them middle skills and higher. You all know about it, frontier skills, et cetera, et cetera. There's the issue of PhD linkages. Uh, these are things you're familiar with. The expert systems have already told you, very important, because, uh, for example, educating the educators, trainers, huge gaps, the quality, you know, it's unimaginable how much. So AI can be used. Not all of us, all the skilled people in uh, Delhi, IEG, uh, Delhi school, etc. we can't go out there and start teaching all the trainers, but you can use the digital economy to give, make them accessible. So those are the kind of things you know, which I can write on one page, but there's a lot of work which needs to be done behind it. So digital India. So one of the ways I expect we will do it to provide, so we, we are pioneering in a way, a third way of innovation and inclusion through di digital infrastructure, because we applied that system. You remember what I said, there are things government has to do, there are things private has to do. One of the great examples of that is in digital India. So what we have tried to do is, provide public goods infrastructure in the digital economy and try to make sure that a competitive economy is created. I'm not saying everything is perfect, but a lot has been done. So universal access, uh, clearly have to eliminate the digital divide. Without it, we can't get this, what I'm talking about. Uh, connectivity, uh, there is something I've been saying, there's still weaknesses, it's not been done fully. We have to get connectivity down to the bottom, completely down to habit villages, habitation. Uh, and free access to the poor, how? Uh, I don't believe in subsidies. One simple way is to get it down in the pub, uh, primary health centers. We have primary health centers, we have primary schools, we have various government organizations. Make it free over there. Let the poor, a little bit effort is done. You know, otherwise things are not sustainable. Subsidies are not sustainable otherwise. You have to have a structure. You have to have that innovation in uh, what I said, the uh, pol policy and institutions, right? So, so, so soft infrastructure, I uh, uh, just mentioned uh, professional independent regulatory system. Still in, in India, I, there's not enough understanding among the general people, uh, politicians, bureaucrats, everybody who's currently involved, they, they don't understand how important uh, a good uh, regulatory system is, a professional. 
because these require professional work. Just like the financial system, we have the RBI and the SEBI, good institutions, decent ones. We've done quite well. So digital is another area which is very important to have professional because there are all kinds of new economics coming up. Uh, algorithms can be biased. They can just play havoc. Uh, you have a Google platform, they can direct everything to Google companies. You've got to have good regulation, but not for control. For, for making sure that there's a living level playing field. And what we are doing is creating these public uh, operating systems. You know, the UPI, you probably all heard of. The big new one is ONDC. It's called uh, one something something. But it's basically an e-trade uh, e platform, which uh, some of us, uh, you know, in fact, I remember writing to uh, this chairman and saying, why don't you do this? It's happening, it's happened. This is one of the quickest things they reacted on. So basically, what is it? It's providing the structure on which all the small people, as well as Google itself, and any large company can operate. But at least these smaller companies will be on the same playing field. So you provide the public, you don't, so everybody doesn't have to go to the Google platform to sell anything. But then those, their algorithms, their structure will decide how much competition is there. So once you provide this, what are you providing? You're providing uh, connectivity to the financial payments, to logistics, to supply, demand, everything is there. Okay? And anybody can come in. Intermediaries can come in, the actual producer can come in. So you're providing this platform, okay, on which everybody can operate on an equal level. After that, it's their problem. They have to uh, innovate, etc. Like I said, uh, uh, you know, as long as so government to provide the competitive structure. Uh, so th this is the second important one, what I call the scalability problem. Uh, India's population is twice that of the U.S. and EU combined. Uh, how do you provide the same quality to so many people? Easy? Not so easy. Does anybody think it's easy? No, okay, then I don't need to go into it. <laughs> but the only way to do it, I believe, uh, in 2006, I was asked to do a paper on how can we improve. Uh, this was in the planning commission under Monte Gadovalia. He said, this is a terrible problem. You tell me what to do. I said, I don't know what to do. Anyway, I said, okay. And I studied uh, the services. And I came to the conclusion, there's no other way besides telemedicine, tele-education. There's no way we can improve the quality to any kind of developed country level. So uh, to give you one simple example, uh, you know, you, you can't have a full-scale school in every village, right? So you've got to grade it. So you, you can't provide uh, a higher a physics teacher, a chemist, but you can centralize them. If you could put people in a district which have all the higher qualifications, you can know, use the internet. There can be people sitting in the local school who will then try to interpret and say, okay, this is what they are saying. Do you understand? Okay. So the, the hybrid model. Okay. So there are many, many examples like that. I, 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 time is running out, so I won't give you, but there are lots of examples like that. But the new thing, of course, is this uh, work from anywhere, work from home. And this is what I believe uh, can be used. Again, I need more research, but uh, what I believe that we can uh, liberate uh, uh, rural women uh, to be able to, uh, one of the hypotheses uh, which I would like to be tested, I mean, everybody believes this, whoever I meet anyway, and I did, is that uh, social conditions uh, restrict them from leaving the home. Now, if you could uh, connect them to their work at from home, then at least in the beginning, even though they are faced, forced to look after the children and the old people and all that, they may still be able to work and empower themselves. So that, that so this uh, work from home, I believe, uh, would be a way of addressing and using that. Uh, Green India, I'll skip over. I want to give some time for yeah uh, for questions. So uh, uh, the only thing I want to mention is that we have a broader diversified portfolio. Here is another thing where we kind of innovated. So oops. Uh, uh, not just the usual things, solar power, but we are thinking of uh, housing efficiency, circular economy, which is recycling, uh, you know, repairing usable, reusable de uh, designs, lifestyles, example, millet, and so on. Uh, 
uh, I just want to mention people who have not read it. Yes, we have a paper actually, Sony and myself, on natural city. We even tried to design what we called a natural city. Okay, so uh, let me uh, conclude then. Uh, India, a high income country by around the mid century, obviously it could be faster or slower, uh, and we need sustained fast growth in per capita income quality of opportunity using the underutilized, these are, as I said, these are somehow they are cliches, but then uh, you have, uh, I mean, it's kind of my job to make sure and concretize them. That's what I, I presume I've been hired to do uh, as a member uh, Niti. Digital economy, uh, again, if you're not convinced, we can ask some questions on this and this so-called paradox so far that we will be third rank, uh, but an income level of uh, 1990. Uh, sorry, F90, and I will just show these. There's a whole bunch of reforms behind it. So there's a paper called India Vision 2050, if you want to go into it more systematically. Uh, and uh, these are the international stuff which I mentioned, but I'm not going to talk about. Oops, that one. Okay, now this part is missing, so let me ask you. Uh, so what I want to do before I close is to, advise, uh, to invite you all and your friends and other researchers. Uh, what I'm looking for is uh, policy research to develop and detail determinants of policy uh, determinants and policy and institutions for sustained inclusive growth. That is the purpose which I outlined there. And, and policy oriented research. What do I mean by that? A simple framework. What is the problem to be addressed? What are the international and domestic evidence uh, and the policy recommendations from that? and possible objections to the policy, okay? So it's a simple framework. Anybody who's interested in doing, uh, getting into policy, uh, I want to invite you all and do mention it to your friends and colleagues. Uh, they are free to email my office or call up my office and come and see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vermani. We have about half an hour for interaction. So I now open the floor for questions. Can we edit them? So if you start us and if you want to question, we have to do that. Yes. yes okay. Uh, thank you for a uh, nice speech. So um, since we're talking about growth uh, and of course infrastructure is something which is very important. And uh, of course the government is taking uh, proper steps towards the national in, uh, infrastructure project, et cetera. So I was just wondering, and uh, you also have uh, in your slide um, how uh, you, know, you have to um, include women. Uh, women participation is so important. So I wonder why uh, child care, or for that matter, old age care, which typically women are uh, you know, responsible for, is not considered infrastructure. So just your comments on that. So uh, the way uh, I think of it, I, I'm using the word I because uh, I'm a kind of half academic, half policy person. So the way, uh, one would think about it is in terms of what is called hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure. Now, uh, public goods infrastructure has a very clear definition. That's why I mentioned the academics. <laughs> There's a clear definition. It has to do uh, with externalities. Okay? So, so the presumption is uh, if there's no gap between social and private returns, the private sector will, will do it, right? But if there's a gap, the government has to do something. So there, there's a definition of public goods and public goods infrastructure. So that applies to both hard and soft infrastructure. Now, 
the infrastructure push has been talked about for ages. My friend uh, uh, Rakesh Mohan did the first infrastructure report, but uh, the, the highway program, uh, which is a classic example, and I'll say a little about that, and then get back to your second question, uh, started in a uh, big uh, wave under uh, startled by uh, ABV, uh, much by his government under a, uh, somebody named General Khanduri. He really got the thing going, and uh, since then it's accelerated. Now, what is it about highways? Well, uh, you know, in, in my youth, there used to be two classic uh, infrastructure, public goods infrastructure. One was ag agriculture, R&D, and extension, and the other was highways. There were tons of studies showing the gap, the social returns to these was very high relative to the private. Okay. So, so that is the definition of infrastructure. What is soft infrastructure? That's what I've been talking about, the, the digital economy. Uh, it, it, it's not the physical getting to the village that is still hard infrastructure, but the public good aspect, which is more tricky because digital economy is new. I mean, I've seen a few papers, maybe uh, some of you have read more, but the economics of it is still not 100% clear to me. There are a lot of things, ha having uh, worked with Kenneth Harrow and did my PhD there, I understand a little bit, but not everything about the digital economy. So so the, the, the soft infrastructure, uh, is the intangibles, right? The, the public goods which are up in the air in some sense. There, there may be programs, there may be something else. Uh, another example of that is e uh, is the, is the is a e electronic agriculture scam or something else. Uh, okay. Now, coming to your issue of uh, uh, childcare, uh, you know, one of the things I did uh, after I joined as member is that uh, I recognize that I've had a 10 year gap, right? Uh, I've left uh, government in 2009, but okay, I was in IMF and got a lot of research and stuff you know, through the staff. Uh, but for 10 years, I was out of it. So one of the things I did is I talked to a lot of people okay, within the AT, outside. And one of the things I found there's a paper on women's work which is already there in Niti, uh, which uh, actually uh, does estimates for uh, a policy to develop pressures. So it's not that nobody has thought about it. Uh, the paper is there. Uh, you know, we are, we are also part of government and a bureaucracy. It just happens to be not my subject. So. But, but it's there, hopefully somebody will pick it up. If somebody ever asks me, obviously I'll tell them, but it's not something that comes under my charge, whatever that, that means. But that doesn't mean it's not there. It does not mean that it's not being thought of, okay? Uh, so it sounded like a reasonable thing to me, uh, but uh, it's not up to me to develop it. So it's important, it has to be thought of, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Virmani, and I hope that satisfies your query. Yes. Partially, yes. Yes. I'm sure we will see many initiatives in this direction. Also, as we move towards SDGs and gender equality, even under that, we would see more so, initiatives. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, let's have another question. Then. Yeah. So, uh, yes, yes, Kundar. I am interested in knowing your opinion about regional inequality in India and what do you think will happen, say, in 2050? Because parts of India already looks like a middle income country, but parts of India per capita income is like a sub-Saharan African region. So, and uh, the problem is that convergence, you can, you, if you think about growth, convergence should happen, but that convergence is not happening. So uh, there, there are several, again, uh, forgive me, but I'm going to answer as with my limited academic approach. I'm not answering as a government, member of government. So there, 
there are lots of complicated issues when I look at it. Uh, so le let me just mention some of them. Now, when I, in fact, I have done a paper uh, with, uh, with uh, Allah and I think where we uh, used the 2011 12 consumption data and come to the conclusion, which I believe is a reasonable conclusion, uh, that inequality as measured from the consumption data, so consumption inequality has fluctuated, but there is not a, a clear trend. Now, the, the big weakness of that is that there is no, uh, you know, there's no survey available after 2011. Uh, we use state level data, state level price indices, state level everything uh, to get its impact on distribution. So we are using the state data because you're talking when you say inequality is increasing, uh, you're talking about the state. So all that we input into the field, we go down to the state level, we calculate uh, the poverty, et cetera, using state indices to adjust the poverty lines, et cetera. So uh, when uh, the second thing is, of course, we know, uh, which is what you're referring to is in terms of uh, per capita or state GDP, uh, there, there is not enough convergence. You, you can say no, okay, I, I, I not, don't have the data on my fingertips. So that, that is an issue. Now, if you are as old as me and I hope no, no, I don't see anybody who is. Uh, uh, there used to be a word called bimaru. Everybody, anybody heard of it? <laughs> Bihar, UP, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Odessa, uh, Rajasthan. Rajasthan and Odessa are out of it. Remarkable progress compared to my ancient mindset. Uh, Madhya Pradesh seems to be halfway there. So really what you got left is Bihar and Eastern UP. Okay. So, so that is the, the, the second uh, point I would make. It can be done. Uh, I'm most pessimistic right now about Bihar. There was a period I actually did a paper uh, which my friend NK Singh asked me to do. And there was a period in which they suddenly were catching up. They're back again. I don't know what happened. I really haven't studied it since then. So, uh, so on a regional level, I think uh, it's very uh, dependent on the state governments. And uh, the, the third aspect, which is related to that is that uh, I am uh, repeatedly shocked at people don't know the basic constitution, okay? the state list of the constitution, the concurrent list and the union list. So, so there are only three or four things which are the business of the state governments. Nobody holds them accountable. Agriculture, health, till, uh, till uh, I think about 15 years ago, education. I never heard anybody holding states accountable. Why is it always that the union government has to do it? I, I genuinely believe this. I'm not saying it now. I've been saying it uh, for 30 years. I don't understand. It has to be done in the state level. You cannot do agriculture from Delhi. You can't provide health. You can't provide uh, the, the education, the, the stuff I'm saying. There still has to be something going on there, okay? On the state level, it's called uh, subsidiarity. The principle of subsidiarity, which is there in the constitution. The only thing which was missing was the local level, which we added on, but has not worked. The Panchayati Raj and Nagar Palika. Actually, now that I've come back and re-educated myself, I've already talked to three, four, five urban experts. They say, this is outdated. Actually, you've got to have integrated, you know, you cannot sub separate out the rural and the uh, small town at that level. It has to be district. You have to do district planning and district public goods and all the stuff I've just mentioned. Okay. So, uh, should be done. Uh, what is the, cent I mean, to tell you one simple uh, policy, which is in my list, you cross subsidize electricity. You think you're benefiting consumers? No, you're making sure that industry will not come there. You have 
three times the price of electricity. You can't have industry without electricity. It can't be all based on coal, that's outdated. So, uh, you know, we, we don't hold the states accountable. Those prices must go down. You won't get industry. You're too expensive. He's a small guy, he can't generate. So uh, there are policies at the state level. Uh, there's accountability of the states. Sorry, I, I've been a little rough on you. I mean, you have a point. I'm not denying your point. But that's how I look at it. That's why I said as an academic. Besides that, the, the, the government is doing. I mean, it's doing the uh, part which it feels, uh, you know, will be useful for whatever purpose, uh, providing LPG, uh, providing uh, housing, toilets, etc. There are all these schemes. But I don't think that's the sustainable way. That's why I said I'm talking as a as an academic here, uh, but the government is doing all these schemes. I don't think that's the solution. But that will have the effect on the overall, that distribution which I mentioned. Yes, but public goods are not measured. By the way, this paper is actually quite interesting because the one I mentioned, it is an IMF paper, if you're interested in poverty, this is the first time I believe that anybody has accounted for uh, non-cash subsidies. When you sell up, uh, when you give rations at three or below the price of food, that is not accounted for anywhere. Okay? So what we did in this paper was to estimate that for one item. And I would have done much more, but there was just no time and the paper was getting too big. Okay? So that applies to any non-monetary subsidy. They are not captured. So if you have, the, I mentioned public goods, if you can provide equal public goods, that's a huge benefit for equality. If you can get the, uh, improve the education of the rural schools, it will be a huge uh, change in equality. You won't measure it, you won't see it. Sorry, I, I'm acting a bit like a professor, but you excuse me. Okay, next. Next question. Yes. Can I ask you a question? Yes. yes. So since you talked about demography, I just want to know your view about pension, especially when you know the old people are living longer. So we need to think about um, old age support, social security, and all those things. So uh, you didn't talk about that. So I just want to. Right. So uh, <clears throat> yeah. So there are a whole bunch of schemes. I, I'm not a scheme person, but I think there are at least five different schemes. Uh, of pension. Some are contributory, some are uh, this thing. There's a scheme for uh, informal workers. Uh, there's, of course, the until the they are scheme, which again started under Vajpayee. Uh, there are a whole bunch of schemes. Uh, and uh, the basic idea is, is financial. I'm in favor of, uh, you know, my welfare reforms uh, have been UIT. I mean, uh, in 2006, uh, I, I, in the old planning commission, I was also in charge of the division which dealt with uh, PDS. Okay? Uh, and I came to the conclusion that, uh, that one of the things which came up, again, I don't know, you guys like stories. <laughs> Actually, that's the interesting part of it, talking to an old man like me. So maybe I'll give you the story. <laughs> So here is the thing. So there was a meeting of food secretaries of all the states. Planning Commission, you remember, I used to give out money and everybody used to come there. And here was this uh, food secretary from Orissa. And he gets up and somebody asks him, people are starving. What is it? Why can't you get some food there? He said, I can't do it. He said it publicly. I was shocked and it set me thinking, I looked at the program, there are, I, I, numbers may be a bit hazy in my mind now, but there was something like 258 different programs at the district level. You know, the main guy in the district is a guy named, is a district collector. 
no human district collector i don't know if your ai at chat pt will be able to ever do it in 2050 maybe no human collector can look after 250 schemes so what happened it's random some pressure from somebody or he's interested he look after two three schemes so my conclusion was that many people are not getting most of this stuff okay errors you you know type one type two errors and so i decided we had to have a uid number okay and i did a paper in 2006 calling for i said from alleviating poverty to eliminating it. and part of the story is very interesting i couldn't get it published in epw you know where it was published in the journal in pakistan because i had a friend there This paper was not even published in India. Why? Because it talked about eliminating poverty. How dare you? Let me tell you another part, interesting part of it. I tried to arrange seminars in the planning commission. Again, I won't name the worthies, but the worthies in charge of poverty did not want even a seminar. So what happened? UID was implemented, it was, I, I took it up to the cabinet level, then I left in 2009, there was a cabinet note pending with the, uh, you know, so I wrote the paper, I got the planning commission to set up a committee, which I chaired, I got the whole thing, I got all the departments together to accept this thing, it was a big struggle, you don't, you know, it's all so simple now. I had to get convergence, because the registrar of Companies thought it is this private fiefdom. How dare planning commission do anything about unique ID number? Because we have some national register of citizens or something. I said, please, don't get me into that controversy. Let's just do this. And I got approval from him. And we did an experiment. We demonstrated how the numbers could be given. We designed a, a structure. And then I got the IT ministry to put up the cabinet note. Then it got stuck. Eventually, of course, you know what happened. It was renamed Aadhaar. Okay. The whole idea was that we must make sure whatever we want to give and connected to that, there are two concepts, I'll just leave it at that, is direct cash transfer and mobiles. Okay. This is something which again I found very difficult for people to convince. If you had put this thing on a mobile, all that stuff you saw during the pandemic, they could have just got it on their mobile, the money. Could have had a special dispensation, give it to the guy who's walking back from Mumbai or Delhi and give it to his wife who's in the village on the phone. That part is still not done, but a lot of, lot of stuff has been done. Right, uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Yes, yes. China does growth targets and, you know, their, their, their policy makers are quite astute and they're able to, you know, for 30, 40 years meet growth targets. And I'm wondering if there's any thinking in India on having that kind of framework where we announce, I mean, we don't have the party commission anymore, but we have Niti Aayog and why can't we have growth targets and figure out you know, what needs to be done to meet those targets, what kinds of investment rates do we need? At least anchor the yeah. policy process. I know it's done internally, but maybe if it's done externally, that would be right. other sides. And then, and then related to that, one of the things that, you know, I've been working on with the Reserve Bank of India DRG study is voluntary transmission and employment. And in that we, you know, we, we look at long time series uh, on employment, which was done through the employment and unemployment survey. There were small rounds, there were bigger rounds every five years. Mm -hmm. I, I, I fail to understand why NITI doesn't partner, not NITI necessarily, but maybe a government agency doesn't partner with a uh, private agency maybe to provide like top quality, high frequency employment data. So now we have CMI, which is a private sector enterprise. We have PLFS, which is government, but uh, why why isn't there uh, 
capacity to have monthly data where we can track, track jobs and sectors, how many are created, uh, uh, you know, things like vacancies relative to unemployment. There are, there are a whole range of uh, unemployment indicators apart from, you know, uh, uh, vacancies, for instance. We have no idea of how many vacancies are being created and so on. Would be great if Niti can, you know, spearhead or uh, partner or uh, help uh, with that process because that's deeply important for growth and uh, going, going, going. Very important. Yeah. Otherwise, we are just hand waving like I was right. saying. Oh, yeah. Measuring, <laughs> measuring employment. Because I don't have anything solid on employment. So two, three uh, points here. Okay. So first, the actual question, and then just general comments on. Uh, so, uh, when uh, Arvind Panagriya you, uh, was the first uh, vice chairman of NITI, and there was talk at that time, I'm talking now as an outsider, I don't know what happened inside, about doing uh, kind of three, five, seven year perspective planning. I don't know what happened today. It's not there. Okay. Now, uh, before you take that historical context is very important, okay? People, uh, this is another problem I have as an old man, is that everybody seems to think history began yesterday is the word I use. So let me give you simple context for this. When I uh, left the planning commission, uh, for a couple of years, I was in charge of kind of like six division, which included PPD, okay? Which is the perspective planning division. You know what I found when I became in charge of it? The only thing that the planning commission had was an Excel sheet run by a guy named Arvinder Singh. Excel. This was the modeling. So I gave six contracts. I got the institutions to make proposals. I gave six contracts. Again, I don't know what happened to it. So when you hear these words, uh, but Bottom line, yes, I think it's very important. Perspective planning is very important. That is one thing on my agenda. Uh, but again, given what I've told you about the history, uh, don't imagine it will be easy for me to do anything like that. But yes, that's very important in my view. That's the whole thing. This is that uh, concept that you can't just do the bottom. You can keep throwing, you have to do two way, right? That's the concept. You do it from top down, from bottom up, and you have to meet in the middle to then direct and for people to take inspiration from it, to fit things together. Everybody doesn't come, uh, you know, born or raised with all these things put together. You have to give guidance, right? So, yes, it's very important. Uh, okay. The, the second one, uh, see that there is... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a frustration which a lot of people are expressing is the NSSO, which has to do it. Only thing I can say is, uh, can, uh, can you give me a two page proposal? This notionally, this stuff is under me. I remember the word notional, <laughs> because the whole structure is different. It is not the old planning commission. In, in the old planning commission, if I was a member in charge of XYZ, I am in charge of XYZ. Now it's kind of, it's understandable. So whole established institution has gone. And then you had three different VCs and you had so many CEOs and all this. It's, you know, you understand what I'm saying, you know, saying it, okay? But uh, you give me something specific and let me see if I can do anything about it, but I can't promise. But there's a third aspect too, which is skills. What has astounded me, we talk about employment. I have not met one labor economist. Please send him to me if you know one who knows anything about search employment, returns to skilling and education, demand and supply of uh, labor for different, not one. How can you do planning for employment if you don't have a clue how any labor market functions, any? You can say there is only one labor market which functions, all the others are distorted, but first, I, I don't even have that one. I don't know anybody who's done anything in this area. And please, I, I beg you, if you know any name who knows something about this, I don't want a brilliant 
academic, but somebody who knows some basic economics of labor and employment, please send them to me. Huh. Well, I would like to say that I completely endorse the need for having a high frequency unemployment yeah. data series. And that's very important for empirical work, for policy yeah. inferences also. And the sooner we can do it, I think the better it would be for planning purposes. Yeah. Oh, right. So sorry, I forgot to mention now we have it's stabilizing, right? We now have an annual uh, thing which was just released and the quarterly. Urban, but the total is still uh, annual, uh, but they've also released uh, last week, uh, the calendar. Year. So they released both the agriculture year till June 2022 and the annual numbers for December 22, plus all the unit level data is now available. So if you are interested in that, you should look at it. There's a lot of data which has finally been released. So I think the, the important thing is actually forget what I said earlier. Do look at that data and tell me if it's any improvement. Yeah, yeah so whoever, yeah. wanted to know like you talked about artificial intelligence digital economy so we see all these developments everywhere but when we are estimating tfp tfp growth for india is not improving so this is not reflected in the numbers so there's kind of a productivity paradox here so so i would like to know your view about uh, what what could be the reason for this paradox and uh, what policies can help us to improve right. the tfp so uh, I believe uh, Dr. Goldar is still in IIT. Yes. Well, no. not in IIT, but he is continuing. I mean, in, uh, in Delhi school. No? Not in, but he is continuing his work on productivity. Yeah. So uh, yeah. the only yeah. thing I have seen uh, is a paper which uh, Dr. Goldar sent me, and I don't get that impression from that. Uh, what I, if I remember correctly, what it showed was that manufacturing TFP is actually increasing. Surprisingly, so kindly look at his paper, yes, sir, or you looked at it already. For Clems, the Clems paper. Yes, sir. So this increase was from 15 to 2017. So after that, there is a decline in productivity. Right, the most recent period, but uh, that is one year, two year, and then the pandemic, right? Before the pandemic, from 2017 right. onwards, the productivity is declining. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, but. Uh, you know, we know that GDP growth de declined in 18 and 19, right? Uh, what? But, yeah. Right, right. So I, uh, I, I've looked at this issue. Uh, there is a paper, which, again, when I say papers, I'm not competing with you academics. <laughs> I just look at it from a policy perspective because I have to understand what is going on. There, there's a, a paper called, you know, in, when I was in the IMF, I did a, a paper on, uh, all the, 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 on on policy reform, the, uh, what's that word you use for trade? Uh, change it, there's a, can have an opposite effect. Yeah, J curve. So I did a paper called the J curve of policy reform. This is what it is. My brain is now slowly <laughs> going out of function. So, uh, so J curve of policy reform. This paper, which I did uh, in eighteen, I think, or yeah, eighteen or nineteen, based on past data, is called the J curve of institutional reform. So, uh, in that, I identify uh, the growth rate, and basically, it has to do with what I call the J-curve of institutional reform, some of the things I mentioned, IBC, uh, GST, uh, the Monetary Policy Committee. I also show how the real rate went way beyond uh, anything which I could justify. And again, I'm not talking in hindsight. I was on the committee uh, before the MPC was formed. 
and I argued against those things. I thought they were overdoing the interest rate hikes, and that's what the data shows. Okay, so I, I'm not saying you're wrong, but what I'm saying is, uh, look at that. There's an explanation there for the decline till 2019. Obviously, the COVID thing is completely different. I don't expect anything productivity increase. So, uh, what that show, what if that theory is right? What would have happened in the absence of COVID would have been a, a, a dip and a rise. Okay? It's when this uh, effect of the institutional reforms, if you believe in it, you know, which I do, I think IBC is an institutional reform, NPC is an institutional reform, but I believe there were J curve effects, which had a negative effect on productivity. So that would be exactly that the, the period you're talking about. This is my viewpoint. You don't have to agree with it, but I would love to have your critique of that paper, by the way. Uh, if, if I may suggest something regarding the productivity data, uh, so uh, you could also look at the WDI database. Um, uh, also, if you look at the sectoral data, you will know where the decline is happening. Uh, Actually, we are trying to estimate TFT in RTI, so LEMS project. So one problem that we are facing is for the recent years, we are having very high employment growth. And since TFT is estimated as a residual, so we don't have a high GDP growth, but we have a high factory input growth. So the residual is turning out to be lower and negative. So it's not, the identity is not uh, adding up. So we are, that's why we are having a very low and uh, negative TFT growth. Okay, maybe we can discuss it later. Well, if you find the answer after reading my paper, I'd like to hear it. Because yeah, I mean, the, the puzzling part still remains why they were adding more people. Even if I'm right about the GDP side, it, it doesn't explain the labor side. I, I... Right, so uh, I think this brings us to the end of a very interesting and interactive session. Uh, it's wonderful to have had uh, Dr. Birmani here. Thank and you. Pleasure. Also to see he's very energetic and <laughs> is also willing to take more questions. <laughs> it seems like it. So but I think we'll have to draw this session to a close right now. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Yes. Would you, you like you to said say energetic. <laughs> I, I was <laughs> I was invited to Stanford with some institution, not the you know, at the university. And they said I'm very passionate. Yeah, I think that's the right I word. Yes. Actually, that's yeah. why I'm in this business. No. That's why I'm in policy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's not all fun and games. <laughs> Thank you for patiently listening. help organize this. Uh, this is a 10 year project. It's ongoing and it's getting bigger and better, I think. So <laughs> with your cooperation and Indian macro is growing and it's uh, edifice, it's a building and it, the building has to grow. And we're kind of like the construction site. So um, we saw a lot of people here today. There were actually I was counting close to 40, 50 across, including excluding the online people. So that was another 10. And uh, there were lots of good papers and hopefully we'll replicate this year after year. Um, this is also the first time that this was done in IEG. So it will happen here for the next couple of years. Uh, but uh, there were many people who were involved in this uh, process. Uh, Mahesh, thank you very much. Nirmal, the director's office, 
Mr. Kanpal, uh, Mr. Jain, um, I'm going down the room over here, Akbar, uh, and Farag, uh, and Mr. Tyagi, and of course, Vikas, and many others. I hope I'm not Mr. Puthiraj, our finance officer. So many people play roles here in doing it. So um, uh, I hope you keep coming back to IG. And we want to make this uh, kind of a good place for macro and macro research and growth and other ancillary uh, related fields. So thank you very much. And that closes the conference.